System equals power equals ideology. One or many males. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, violet, and indigo. Who is dancing with these rainbow colors in the sky? Air after rain, slanting sun, mountains and passes turning blue in each changing moment. Fierce battles that year, bullet holes in village walls. These mountains so decorated look even more beautiful today. Tapote, summer, 1933, Mao Zedong. Rainbow spectrum. We begin with the color red, the color of the two-year-old Chinese Soviet Republic in Changchi, and then others, warm orange, then yellow and green. A line break and coldness, blue, violet, indigo. Here, for a moment, is a quiet reflection upon the rainbow multiple that consists some dancing in the sky. Or, rather, the colours are instruments for the dancing that is going on in the sky. Some unknown force is combining the two verse lines of colour and the seven different colours into a unified movement, and they hang as traces of a dancing that yet remains invisible. The figure, and perhaps the dance itself, are still unknown. They are an order that does not reveal itself but rather seeks to give an impression of beauty even after conflict. It is this idea of parts holding together a unity rather than a unity holding together parts that defines Mao's thinking from this time. But in 2012, images of the new China do not admit so easily to the presence of multiples. The Western and Chinese media and the Chinese state prefer to give us powerful images, emphasizing the importance of the parts while highlighting the overbearing nature of the whole. In a recent issue of the journal Social Text, Akbar Abbas points out two of the first images that come to mind when we think of the new China. The man facing the tanks at Tiananmen Square in 1989 and the stadium for the 2008 Olympics. Abbas notes the development that has taken place in between the taking of the images and proposes that Chang Yimou's 2008 opening ceremony was a way of, quote, exercising the ghosts of 1989 by performing, quote, with confidence in this new space, end quote. That is, by demonstrating that the virtual world is, quote, more malleable and controllable than natural space, end quote. Inferring from Abbas, we can say that what has happened here is an attempt not only to make concessions to the new and potentially frightening capitalistic world of social media and networks, but also an attempt to subsume them into the greater narrative of the whole, the greater narrative of China. The image that Abbas does not mention because, and I don't say this to spite him, its inclusion would have been incongruous at best in his piece, it is too whole, unmalleable, and a kind of historical signifier that he wants to avoid in taking into account the faces of modern China, is the well-known Chang Chenxi portrait of Mao Zedong that adorns images of China, most noticeably, in my case, Facebook pictures of friends returning from the Forbidden City. The image is monolithic, terrifying to Westerners weaned on the fear of the Cultural Revolution and of the 20 million who perished under his rule. Strangely, full of compassion, yet empty as a space between Ai Weiwei's hands in the triptych dropping a Han Dynasty urn. In the triptych, I can only gesture as the Han Dynasty urn has left his hands and is in pieces on the floor in front of him. Yet Ma was also the author of Tapoti, a poem which becomes a little clearer with reference to On Practice, a 1937 essay of Mao's which delineated the dialectical materialist theory of the unity of knowing and doing. Mao called this practice. Discover in truth through practice, and again through practice, verify and develop the truth. Start from perceptual knowledge and actively develop it into rational knowledge. 
then start again from rational knowledge and actively guide revolutionary practice to change both the subjective and the objective world. Practice, knowledge, again practice, and again knowledge. The profound simplicity of this theorem is all the more remarkable if one considers that its author had already implemented a set of purges that saw around 100,000 people exterminated. It is tempting to romanticise the Mao of this era, to think of him as a ragged revolutionary in the face of Chiang Kai-shek's brutal Kuanming Tang, perfectly attuned to the dialectical significance of what was going on around him. Indeed, his easy conversational tone paints an incredibly convincing portrait to this effect. The reality was very different. Mao was sidelined, disgraced even at this point, criticised by the leaders of the Communist Party and consigned to being a figurehead. The battles he is remembering in Tapoti are most probably those of 1929, already only memories to the poet Mao who looks back with some nostalgia even, although they are still necessarily present in the final enunciation of the word today. But what do the image of the rainbow, the face of Mao, and the two faces of the new China have to do with each other? The title of Abbas's article is China and the Human. Indeed, this is the title of the entire two-volume edition of social text in which it is contained. It is aptly chosen, for the essay and the volumes provide multiple analyses not only of the effect of China on the human, a new socialist human, but on a very simple level, the dialectic between human, the individual and his or her needs, and the state, China, a single signifier that is not human. What better then to place against Abbas's images of the human in China than the China in the human? the face of Mao as deity, Mao as the embodiment of China and the direction of the revolution. Many Maos. Chu Changfu, in an article entitled The Incomplete Transformation of Sinicized Marxism, explains that this role of the single signifier is the role Marxism plays in China today. In the article, published in the journal Socialism and Democracy, he notes that, quote, the most important role that Marxism plays in China is to be the ultimate rationale and justification for the party's practices. Chang Fu's argument gives an interesting glimpse behind the shiny facade of the Chinese state media and shows us the importance of Marxism to Chinese intellectuals today. Chu criticizes the self-reflexive and what he calls hermeneutic form of Marxism that has been created in China today through decades of what he calls pragmatic, translating, introducing, and propagandizing the theory. And he laments the abandonment of theoretical discourse and dialogue that has gone hand in hand with the hermeneutic Marxism he describes. Indeed, the fact that his article, by all accounts an insistence on Marx's original theories, has been banned in China, says a great deal. But Mao's influence, like Marx's, extended beyond his own country's national boundaries. The title of this meditation, System Equals Power Equals Ideology, comes from a note scribbled by the French Marxist intellectual Louise Althusser, and is noted in another article in the same issue of Social Text. Emily Robsy, the author of the second article, makes the point that Althusser's notes contain clippings of an article that uses Mao's theory to refute the bourgeois humanitarianism preached by the Soviet revisionists. This particular article goes on to say that, quote, as President Mao has taught us, there is only a concrete human nature and not an abstract human nature, end quote. Here and again, we see the single smiling face of ideology presented as a unitary mode of human organization something like the many hundreds of dancers moving to the design of a single choreographer at the Olympics opening ceremony, or maybe one of the mass choreographed public displays over the border in North Korea that viewers became so accustomed to on their newsreels following the death of Kim Jong-il last year. Althusser mimics Mao's dialectical materialist theory of knowing and doing, 
when he infirms in his 1973 essay Reply to John Lewis. Everything that happens in philosophy has, in the last instance, not only political consequences in theory, but also political consequences in politics, in the political class struggle. Here, theory begets action, and the one single signifier enshrined as theory, or a theoretical development, determines the course of political discourse. This is the face of Mao looking into the future and communicating it back through some obscure quality of his gaze to the Chinese people. But Althusser also says that philosophy is, in the last instance, the theoretical concentrate of politics. Politics begets theory, that in turn begets politics, and so on. The similarity of Althusser's thought to Mao's is striking, and even more so when considering the liminal nature of such an arrangement. This is what Abbas calls a perpetual motion between promise and compromise, permission and prohibition, free agency and control. Inherent in this form of Marxism is what Althusser might call a conflict between ideological state apparatuses, ISAs, and the theory that seeks to understand them, perhaps the dialectic that produces such a theory in the first place. An ISA is a function of ideology that enforces the reproduction of the conditions of its production at the same time as it produces, and in order to be able to produce not through coercion, but through ideology, or what might be called social programming of the human being. Althusser's examples of ISAs include the church, the family, propaganda, and so on. The Freudo-Marxist philosopher Slava Zizek might call this the point of dialectical analysis, the function of which is to, quote, demonstrate how every phenomenon, everything, that happens fails in its own way, implies a crack, antagonism, imbalance at its very heart. The crack implies a multiple nature to everything, the rainbow in tapoti that is held together as parts, but is still made up of separated colours. Its very nature is multiple, a crack between theory and practice, acknowledged by Mao as contradiction in a later essay. This is the theoretical and diverse form of Marxism that Chu Changfu's essay calls for. He asks for a re-theoreticization of a system that focuses on a single signifier and a diversification in the face of this unity. He is calling for a Tapoti-esque rainbow of many colours as opposed to the unit mentality praised in a later poem by Mao from 1961, Militia Woman, inscription on a photograph. How bright and brave they look, shouldering five-foot rifles on the parade ground lit up by the first gleams of the day. China's daughters have high, aspiring minds. They love their battle array, not silks and satins. So though this is the face of Mao that is known best in the West, I would like to posit a kind of rupture, for this, in my opinion, is not the only Mao. For the second Mao, one of his exhortations to dialectical investigation might serve as the best example in light of what I have said. The one I have chosen is contained in another of Mao's essays, this one from 1930 called Opposed Book Worship, and contains all the multiples, dialectics, and ruptures in two simply worded lines. Get into the struggle. Go out among the masses and investigate the facts. <laughs> 